<laughs> okay, now that we got travel logistics out of the way. Um, no, this is, this is great, and um, so I'm excited. Now, for those of you that, you know, not many people know that actually Ryan and I were classmates at Cornell, graduated in 2002. And uh, we both have had very like different entrepreneurial journeys, but it's just been so awesome to like to see yours, Ryan, and we're excited to have you here. Likewise, watching yours. Uh, people don't know Scott was the head of the entrepreneurship club. He did all the work, and I was on the uh, the board and just attended a couple meetings. <laughs> I, I, I'm like starting to forget all this. I know. I, I just remember. Um, yeah, I remember the club. I remember the club. There you go. I remember you at the board meetings. Anyway, so so let's talk about a little bit about your your experience as a as a Cornell student, and then we'll get into Honey and all the all the stories that have happened since. But um, I'll ask a question that I know the answer to, but did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? <laughs> Apparently I did, yeah, no. Um, we both grew up on the, the back of the original dot-com bubble, so there was a lot of excitement and activity building companies. There was a couple companies started by students a couple years ahead of us that sold to Microsoft for what at the time was, Jump, a, right? was an yep. absurd amount of money. And so we saw that it was possible and um, got, got the bug. Um, and so it took a while before I got to a thing that started to work out, but um, always knew that I wanted to, to build, and it felt like the biggest way to have an impact is to build a company, because you get to feed back everything that you do into the company and try harder and harder things. Yeah, and it was a special time, because it was right after that boom. So in some ways, we had the benefit of both the, um, both the stories of grandeur, as well as the realities, practical realities, of like actually having to build a business. And I guess you could argue that those are the two kind of threads you need to make this work. Yeah, I think uh, seeing what not good times look like, I think, is a, an important part of knowing how to survive as an entrepreneur. Yeah. I think the last 10 years has been um, interesting in that we haven't really had that dip. And yep. it'll be interesting to see what happens the next time we have something like that. Well, likely great companies will be born when that happens, and uh, which brings us to Honey. So for context, for those of you that don't know, so we're talking about a company that you co-founded. Um, you raised a total of around, I think, 50 million, something like that, and ultimately sold to PayPal for about 4 billion. No doubt your investors were very happy, just such an incredible journey. Uh, so maybe you could give us a sense of like, why'd you start Honey in the first place? When did the idea strike and what happened next? Um, yeah, so it, it turns out that um, being a lazy person in general worked out for me. I, I was playing around with uh, what at the time was a, a very overlooked platform, uh, browser extensions, and Google had done a lot of things to to clean up the ecosystem. And so, as a developer, um, kind of a I took a I did computer science minor at Cornell, uh, but kept my skills good enough to tinker. And so, I was playing around with the browser extension platform, thinking about what you might be able to do, and um, I was feeling cheap and lazy and decided to uh, use the platform to automatically apply all the coupons out there to my cart to save, save a buck. Um, and it turns out that I'm not the only person in the world with uh, these characteristics. <laughs> and so it's been a pretty wild ride. I mean, listen, you know, whenever you see a coupon code box at checkout, like you always want to just go to Google super quickly, right? It's like, you know, love every coupon code or whatever it is and, uh, and find one. So you, you were like, okay, why that should be happening automatically. Yeah, it's like to take the, that labor out of it. Yep. Um, it's because it's almost challenging your intelligence as a shopper right at the moment you're about to buy something. If you see this box and it's asking you, are you going to be the sucker that doesn't go do <laughs> right. this coupon search or not? And you're doing a trade off in your head of, do I think there's going to be one out there that's going to work? Um, maybe I start looking, and what happens a lot of the time is you actually just abandon the cart. And right. So um, that it, we've made it easier to, to get consumers to that confidence that, yes, now is the time to check out. You're not a sucker. If there's a deal, you're getting it. And uh, it's been a, a cool journey to go from, I think when we first launched the company, we talked to investors. This might be some leading into some other questions you have, but... Uh, was told by a prominent uh, VC who had founded an e-commerce company that the first thing he would do if he saw this as a retailer, and he used to be one, um, would be to write code to break everything that we did, and he would open source it and give it to everybody. <laughs> so we didn't raise money from him. Um, 
But it turns out that there's actually a lot of value for the, the retailer and what we do. It just took us a really long time to learn how to communicate that story and led to a, a real grind phase for the company. Yeah. I mean, there's a theme emerging here, which is that when VCs tell you something is really crazy and you shouldn't do it, a number of speakers have said today that that's exactly what they did, and that's why they were successful. Um, yeah, and no, we, we believe that what we were doing was important um, at the time. So we didn't raise any money from anybody outside of the company, um, or like we basically just didn't pay ourselves and threw a couple thousand bucks in the server bills, kind of running the company for two years. And... The, the thing that gave us confidence to keep pushing on it was, and I, I told people, like, we are the last button that people are clicking before they decide to buy anything online. Right. If I can't figure out how to make a business out of that, <laughs> I need to go back to that other school that gave me a business degree right. <laughs> and tell them I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, and so it, it took us a while to figure it out, but once things clicked, it started. Being and what was more. that moment? When you, you know, do you remember that moment when you saw some graph or some chart and you're like, oh, wait, this is working? I, I, I do. So we, we couldn't raise money at all. Pitched everybody on Sand Hill Road because that's where the center of gravity was then. We drive up from L.A., literally drive in a car because we didn't have any money. Um, every week, just go up, meet some investors. No, 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 no. Drive back down. Um, and we went after, like, not being able to raise money, went heads down on just, we're just going to build this product. We're excited about it as people. On the consumer side, the traction was incredible. It was spreading virally, word of mouth. People were like, this is an amazing product. <laughs> I love it. Um, and so it was working. And we just couldn't get people excited about it because everybody was looking for the next big thing to be on a mobile app. Mm -hmm. um, Fred Wilson had just written a piece about how everything should be mobile first. And investors are pointing at that and like, what's your mobile strategy? And like, <laughs> our mobile strategy is to build a really good desktop experience and maybe someday we'll build something for mobile. Um, and so it was impossible to raise or else we're just really bad at fundraising, one of the two. And the moment when it started to work, we finally got somebody to make a small bet on us um, in LA locally. We had just enough money to hire somebody to run our partnership sales team. And he had um, relationship credibility with potential customers hmm. who, for the first time, we could crack through into the affiliate marketing space, which um, part of the reason we couldn't raise money is we're like, hey, maybe we can monetize through affiliate. And, and, and VCs are like, yeah, they don't like that. <laughs> desktop and <laughs> affiliate. And, um, and so it, it was... Uh, bringing in somebody who we could learn into, lean into his personal reputation to demonstrate what we were doing to retailers. And once we did that, we started monetizing like immediately well, because we already had a couple hundred thousand consumers using the mm -hmm. product because they loved it. And it flipped the, flipped the numbers. So first, wow, we're making money. We can keep doing this forever. That feeling as an entrepreneur, when you become like like, oh, I can pay my own salary. <laughs> I can do this for real. Like, look, mom and dad, I'm not wasting my time. Um, like that, that moment. And then we started doing uh, experimentation and paid acquisition on Facebook. And the payback periods were less than two months. And we're just like, wow. oh, holy shit. Just toss every dollar we get onto that thing. Yep. And that's what we did for the next three, four, or five years. And what was, the, what was the value proposition for the companies? Because you're going to them and you're basically saying, hey, let's have every customer that hits your web page automatically get a coupon and get a discount. Like, are, were you, there must have been like some lead gen you were providing. What was the value prop? Yeah, it's, 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 the piece of it are counterintuitive. It's a portfolio of things. Um, ultimately, a lot of it comes down to conversion rate optimization. Mm -hmm. um, it's similar to, and we were able to sell it by analogy of they're already paying um, coupon code websites to do a very similar thing, except the coupon code sites are extracting you out of the cart to go search for a coupon on their site and right. then maybe come back. Um, we simplified that process. And then with the uh, cashback program, um, th those two things kind of were something they already understood. Mm -hmm. uh, so that helped. The, the second piece is um, really like driving that consumer behavior to be confident that you're going to check that you should check out right now. Mm -hmm. And 
the number of cycles where we, we could see because we're a browser extension where people would leave and abandon a cart, which is still a huge yep. source of uh, issue for retailers. If instead we give you the answer to buy right now, and our answer is yes every single time, yeah. you click on the button, I would like permission to buy. It's like, oh, you get a coupon code, sweet, or no, there's no coupons. And our audience is not people that are hyper-optimized in discount seekers. Uh -huh. It's people that don't want to feel like they're getting had. And right. so um, as we got better and better at telling that story, it, it worked well. So, so maybe talk to us a little bit about, I mean, you mentioned the fundraising and how investors were, were not really, you know, it's, it's funny because if you can really make a material impact in a commoditized workflow or a commodity, you can have a huge business, right? But it's still, everyone's looking for the edge. Everyone feels like if it's, you know, if it's commoditized at all, it's not a good business sometimes. Um, and then, of course, investors get stuck on these sound bites of it has to be mobile, it has to be this, it has to be that. Now it's probably it has to be crypto or whatever yeah. the case may be. But what, what, uh, what, what did help you get through and, and what would you learn from kind of the earlier investors that well, got it? To be fair, we tried to look like whatever the flavor of the day was <laughs> <laughs> for multiple years. Right. Um, literally throwing stuff at the wall that wasn't the core to try to look different. Um, and that didn't work either. But we built a product where you could pay with Bitcoin. Um, we bought a pizza with Bitcoin. Um, Honey, the company, is actually a creditor in the Mt. Gox bankruptcy uh, situation, <laughs> uh, for those of you that were in crypto back in 2013 or so. Um, so anyway, we were experimenting with whatever we thought might make the story look a little bit different, but deep down we knew that our business was building better shopping experiences for consumers, yep. and if we made it better, easier, save money, um, we'd be able to bring together a lot of consumers. And if you have a lot of consumers that are doing the most valuable thing they do on the internet, um, there's a lot of ways to extend the product suite to, to add a lot of value to retailers too. Mm -hmm. And so concerns people have around how their data is using and Facebook's tracking me everywhere and things like that. Um, we thought there was better ways to build efficient advertising products for retailers to reach consumers but doing it around the context of an offer yeah. so that you as a consumer are getting value directly um, yep. for, for that. You know, another question that I think a lot of entrepreneurs will get in here or have gotten is, you know, you, you go and you pitch a product you're trying to build and then there's always the question of, well, why wouldn't Google just do that? Or why wouldn't PayPal just do that? Now, as we have now are also in big companies, we actually know the answer to that question, <laughs> which we'll get to later on. But, um, but how did you, you know, Google could have just shipped the extension in their browser by default and save everyone a fortune and everyone would go off and be merry and happy. Like, how did you confront that? They, they still could. And I think every company that's building on somebody else's platform has some degree of platform risk. Um, even Facebook has platform risk that Apple is changing how ad tracking is working and it has a material impact on their business. And so that's something that we were always aware of. Um, for us, it was less likely that we thought Google was going to build something like this, but um, as the purveyor of the platform, it's, it was massive platform risk every step of the way. Yep. Um, Microsoft, for a while, we actually did partner with them to build a mobile browser extension into their Edge browser, and they subsequently now have a competing product that they built internally. So could the big guy do this? Um, in some cases, yes. For us, it's really about delivering to the consumer uh, that value proposition and staying focused on that because that, the central piece of our thesis was always that p there's a lot of really cool new technology tools out there and there aren't a lot of companies that are using them to build better consumer experiences. And that was like core foundational principle. Yep. And I think that's true um, in a lot of contexts. It's a domi dominant strategy of retail is be the most consumer friendly. It worked for Sears, it worked <laughs> for Walmart, it's working for Amazon, it will always be true. And so I think that's one of the things getting to your question on, like VCs are looking for some new mega trend to hop onto and technology driven thing. But at the end of the day, people have a lot of the same needs over time. Like I guarantee you right now, somebody's creating a new dating app situation and it's going to become a very big business because it solves for this, a, a different moment in time for a different cohort of users. Um, we did it for coupons. I think a lot of the categories that exist will continue to exist. Yeah. They're ripe for reinvention. 
And it kind of goes back to your, I mean, where you started around kind of the laziness as the frustration or the inspiration point, because it seems like the best consumer experiences and products, they kind of tune into the fact that every one of us is in the first 30 seconds of any product we're using, we're all lazy, vain, and selfish, right? I mean, we don't have the tolerance to read things, to do research, to watch tours, to learn and onboard and whatever else, because we're too busy. We have our work, our families, and other things are important to us. Of course, we'll invest in a product further down the road, right? If it gives, us, it gives us value. Like I'm sure some people would get honey and just get a discount. And then after four or five discounts, they're like, okay, now what is this thing? Like then they yeah. kind of go and start to explore and learn. Yeah, I mean, we have a whole cohort of users that um, they install it because they hear about it once and then their first product experience isn't for a month or two later. Yeah. And so that like, it really helped with, or hurt the speed of viral growth because a lot of viral products, it's it's loaded with a message from your friend forcing you to use it. The engagement yeah. loop, the cycle time is really compressed. For us, the cycle time of viral distribution was literally measured in months. Yeah. And so we were slowly, steadily growing over time. Yeah. Um, and it just, that, that compounding effect was similar to what you'd see in like a social app product. It's just massively stretched out in time. Yeah. So we had to solve for growth other ways. Yep, and just make it super simple and value immediately. Um, the, uh, so maybe talk to us a little about the, the, the team. So I know you had um, a co-founder, George. Yeah. How did you guys meet? How did you decide to work together? So George and I met uh, at a networking event on a Saturday morning at Caltech hmm. um, in, in sunny Pasadena, California. It started at 8 a.m. Um, neither of us had any reason to be there, but we happened to be. Um, I, was, I was working for a venture firm at the time in Boston, um, semi-commuting to LA, making the case that there might be something interesting happening in LA. Um, but so I, m I met George at the event. We show up and it's nothing but relatively older than us people who all seem to know each other, <laughs> talking to each other, and we're standing by the fruit platter with nobody else like us and so we started talking to each other. They should have all just written a $10,000 check. <laughs> you know? I mean, that would have saved so much agony for us. <laughs> um, so we didn't have the business idea. He was running some other companies, um, had a few smaller exits, and had actually prior to selling the company later, he had never had a boss in his entire life, which is kind of cool, I think. Um, but so we, we headed off, stayed in touch, worked on a few other things uh, on the side. Like I brought him in to help when I was at the LA Times for a little bit. Um, and then I got laid off by the LA Times and we decided to work on startups together. But Honey didn't happen for another year plus after that of just trying lots of things that didn't work. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, that persistence and that very, like, messy, volatile starting stages are typically obfuscated in the stories. Uh -huh. You know, all, all, the, all, the, all the news that came out around Honey is like, oh, you know, I enjoyed me, idea, $50 million in funding, $4 billion acquisition. It's like, oh, it just seemed like a linear, you know, <laughs> progressive. But it wasn't that way. And in fact, you were the original CEO, right? I was. Tell us about what happened and then yeah. how that changed and what you learned in that early stage. So if you started the company, and we started doing this when we pitched it later, like if you started in 2015, it looks awesome. Like yeah. everything's great. We started making money, like <laughs> great unit economics. Um, the company actually started in 2012. <laughs> And we were working on stuff starting in like 2011 together. And so, th yeah, that, that first phase, I, I, I built the original product, um, coded it in the middle of the night a few times. Um, and b because of that was the CEO at MBA. It just made sense, although we did confuse a lot of investors when we were pitching uh, because George uh, was born in China. And we walk in there and... George is like a product, like he's, he's actually product mind person for the company. And I was the guy that wrote the code and VCs were like, wait, the MBA wrote the code? Mm. <laughs> this, is, this is suspicious. Um, so it probably didn't help that he had the white MBA guy was the one that was not uh, <laughs> the C. Defying yeah. stereotypes from the get go. That's yeah. good. Um, but yeah, so we, we ground a lot of grind through that phase, pulling in anybody we could find to like help out on the side. Um, I had, so for the first year, but basically two years I was working on startups full time. Uh, after that first year of Honey, we were unable to raise money. I personally was burning through cash that I had. 
um, and the zero point was two months away and I actually went to work at another company uh, on, as a product manager and because I needed the money through that grinding phase. And so at that point in time, George became the CEO because you can't have the CEO have another job. Like that's <laughs> talk, we were already <laughs> unable to raise money. Now you've got the founder has another job is the CEO. It, all of the negative signaling you could possibly have. Um, and so he became CEO, kept the lights on, user growth still kept going with that long um, growth cycle time. And, it would, and then we, we somehow scrapped together a couple bucks to start hiring, like especially on the sales. That was, that was uh, a, a start. Crucial moment. You know, that was a moment. Um, and then I rejoined the company when we had like six people, because put the money toward hiring other people before I was even in. It's like, yep. I'm gonna work hard no matter what. So. Yep. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I just think it's an amazing testament to the fact that um, it, it's, you know, the, the, it's like the greatest competitive advantage in Silicon Valley is like sticking together long enough to figure it out. And, and so it's so hard to yep. do. I mean, it's easy to reflect now, but to, to go through two to three years to see a zero balance in your bank account two months out, to have to take another job, to switch the CEO roles, to then come back, I mean, to have all these no's. Just, you know, I guess everyone should know that when you go through that, it's essentially par for the course. It's par for the course. People don't talk about that part. Um, they don't talk about even in the good part. Like, I, I think your book does a good job talking about how even when things are going great, your job is to focus on the part that sucks <laughs> every day. <laughs> um, and so you're constantly feeling like things aren't going how they should. And um, it, it's normal if you're starting a company to have, uh, have challenges all of the time. That's, that's by the definition of what the job is. Yeah. Um, and so having that experience, I think, on the plus side for me has given me so much like gratitude and like it's from there, it's just been amazing. Yeah. Um, but without that context, I don't know if I would appreciate it the same way. Yeah. So, so let's talk a little bit about marketing, you know, and you know, it's one thing to have a product that works, you know, it's even one thing to have customers that love the product, but still you can die if you don't find a way of this spreading, right? And so what was the, what was the strategy to like just push the spread and how did you build out the team to do that? Yeah, so like everything we did, we were hands on way in the weeds on doing every piece of the business. I think I had every job as like the primary individual contributor at some point in the company's path, just out of necessity. Um, very first principled approach to it. But yeah, we started making a little bit of revenue um, through some affiliate partnerships. And we started then just me and George experimenting with uh, buying Facebook ads. And we've got pictures of us like on a Friday night, just sitting on a patio, like cranking out Facebook heads, <laughs> <laughs> um, trying anything and everything, a lot of experimentation, reverse engineering how the platform actually works and did the targeting and did like allocation of um, wh where you get impressions and learning a lot about how it worked for communicating our value proposition. And finding things that worked. So a lot of trial and error, but we found like in the earliest days, one of our most successful landing pages was actually driving people to a Business Insider article hmm. of which it wasn't even about us. We were one of 10 things on a list. Wow. So it's like a listicle article from Business Insider. We did paid promotion at that and probably drove uh, over time millions of people to that page, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, and so we found things like that, that that worked for us. And then we started to really try to understand why they were working. And one of the things that like, became like a core observation for us is we have a product that's almost too good to be, fr to be true. It's mm -hmm. like a free tool that gives you free money for doing less work. Like, well, <laughs> well, that's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, sounds like a scam or like you're gonna charge me for it or what's, what's the catch? And there isn't a catch. And so one of the things that we found is that by leaning into credibility of other people and other channels, we were able to overcome that credibility gap. And so fast forward a couple of years from early days of Facebook working, um, we learned how to work with uh, influencers in particular on YouTube to lean into the credibility that they have with their audiences, the ability to speak the language of their audience, 
and it's been incredible for us. And so we've done, if you, if you ha watch YouTube or you have kids that watch YouTube, um, you, they have seen, <laughs> if you watch Mr. Beast. Um, it's a lot of honey. A lot of honey. <laughs> so that's worked really well for us and continued to be good partnerships. And so it's really finding like the first principle on why yeah. things are working on top of the experimentation. I think there's a lot of marketers that are inclined, well, let's A-B test the shit out of everything and just throw things at the wall. Th that's one piece of it. But then when you figure it out, like figure out how it, what worked and you can repeat it more yeah. effectively. I think that that's a great takeaway. And I think that so it's almost like we should all have, we should have a spaghetti on the wall phase, right? Where you just try lots of stuff, but tune into the data deeply and then find pockets that work, start to like really iterate and do more testing within those pockets and then find your like, and then when you find the strategies that really work, it sounds like you just have to throw dollars into it as fast as you can. Throw, throw dollars in it and, and yeah, we, and then also something we did that was maybe counterintuitive and kept us lower profile than we could have been is once we figured it out, we kept our mouth shut. Yeah. Like the last right. thing we wanted was to go tell TechCrunch that we found the gold mine. <laughs> so I don't need every company that is struggling <laughs> Doing to, the same to pivot thing. into my business. Right. Um, and so we, we kept it as like, no, this is just, it's a browser extension on the desktop. Right. Not sexy at all. Nothing to see here. Yep. Um, <laughs> and, and that, that helped like, reduce the amount of competition that yeah. came into the market. Got it. So just last question, and then I'll turn it over to the floor. Um, talk, talk, to us, talk to us about the exit. So I know it's always like an emotional journey. You know, I remember the, you know, the, the amount of years that led up to it in my world. I mean, I'm sure you have. What's that crazy story that yielded this outcome? So if you had asked us two days prior to like it escalating, if we would ever sell the company, um, the answer would be no. Um, George and I built the ultimate dream company, working with some of the best, smartest, like coolest people that we ever have known. Um, it didn't. It wasn't a job. It was like the dream. And so, we we plan to eventually take the company public and have like hundred year product vision on what this thing that we can do to build better and better tools for consumers to to shop and do like all sorts of things. Um, so no plan to sell. We, at various points in time, as we scaled, um, we, we, we scaled basically taking every dollar that we got and putting it back into the business. And so we effectively ran a cash flow break even for the entire growth phase of the company. But even doing that, you start to run into like needing to have enough cash on the balance sheet to support like the risk profile that you have where uh, if we're doing 50 million a year in revenue, like you need to have, um, like you got 100 people, you need to have some cash on hand. You can't just run it at zero. And in growing a company, you're also giving people equity and talking about communicating the value of that. And so we did a series of like fundraisers that were largely designed to reprice the equity so that we could communicate a value of an offer to new hires. Um, so we were in the process of doing something like that. Uh, it would have been our series E, but total in 50 million ever. Um, and we started talking to PayPal Ventures and all of a sudden, instead of it being just PayPal Ventures, there's like 40 people in the room uh, for a meeting. Like, uh, okay, <laughs> this, is, this is accelerating quickly. Um, and it, it became clear that they, they were interested in, in doing something more. I think for us, we still had no intention of selling and it wasn't until we really dug in with the team and with Dan, the CEO, and there's a shared vision and a way of thinking about the world that we saw that, hey, maybe this actually would be kind of cool. Um, PayPal is this great tech company that a lot of people don't think about. It's one of the biggest like tech companies in the world. People don't really think about it in the tech giant class. It's one of the biggest financial services institutions in the world. People don't think of it as a bank. And so it's really interesting set of company assets that we thought would pair interestingly with our vision for what we could do together. And so that was one piece. And then the second piece is they came to the table with an offer that was paying ahead of where we actually were at that point in time. And we're sitting on enough risk factors like platform risk and things like that, transition to our mobile experience, what that was gonna look like, that it kind of made sense to, to team up with Team PayPal mm -hmm. and uh, see what we could do with the, the combined entity. So 
Well, what a story. Uh, thanks for also sharing a lot of the nuances and lessons learned along the way. So let's, let's, I think we have some time for questions, right? It is, it is. So unfortunately, we only have time for one or two tops. And the reason for that is that Monique, our next speaker, has, oh, yes, to, Miami. Oh, my has God. to get on an airplane back to Miami for her daughter's birthday party. Oh, we're going to get, okay. Which we are not going to get in the way of. <laughs> okay, so I will take a question. Just dead now. Just so. the mic. Go ahead. Hi, Ryan. Uh, Jamie Berniker. Uh, fa fascinating story, and, and we see the value of what you've done, especially with, um, with PayPal and their super app aspirations. As the, as the co-founder, and, and as you said, you were an overnight success, uh, and that took a decade. Um, can you explain some of the um, fast, we believe in like pivoting and, and failing fast. Can you give an example of where you failed fast and pivoted, and one where you're like, oh, well, we should have done that failure and moved off of that a lot quicker. I think in the in the version where we were trying a, a lot of different things like crypto payments and stuff like that, it was experiment, see if it works, see if it's going to um, solve for the problems that we have. There we iterated quickly, tried different things. Um, it, there's, we, we launched a grocery app at some point. Um, it was kind of <laughs> like honey for clipping grocery coupons. It was awesome. We got sued, so we shut down the product. <laughs> that, that accelerated the, the, the cycle time on that. Uh, but with the core product, we always had conviction that what we were doing was important, and we could see that it was working on how consumers were responding to it. Great. OK, one, one more in the back. Hi. Uh, thanks for coming to talk to us. Um, how did you deal with companies like Ebates giving the exact service that you give after, after you've already given it for so long for free? Uh, and also, just a quick one, how did you come up with the name Honey? Just interested. <laughs> um, yeah, so with, with competitors like Ebates, um, we actually have partnered with Rakuten, which owns Ebates uh, for a long time. They're one of the big affiliate networks, and so I have an interesting relationship with them. Ultimately, having more people doing similar products to us actually reinforced the message that we were already going out into the market with on the merchant side. And then on the consumer side, we always had confidence that we could build better consumer experiences than anybody else and had a lot of unique capabilities and insights that um, would be hard to, to, to copy and they'd be copying where we were a couple years ago. And so we, we didn't really ever worry about competition like that. For the name Honey, um, we, we actually, the origin of the seed of the name was we were watching a viral YouTube video about the honey badger. The honey badger don't care. And we thought that that was pretty funny with what we were doing, bashing coupons uh, to, at websites. Uh, we don't care. And we thought maybe that would be a little adversarial and dated as a, a viral video meme. And so, like, oh, what about just honey? And we, we, we loved it. And it, it basically just stuck immediately. And one of the things we really liked about it was it comes up in everyday conversation in a lot of different contexts, which plants the seeds for people to tell each other about the product. Hmm. You see something that reminds you of this thing. It's like, oh, yeah, honey. Um, and so that extra benefit in <laughs> real world viral word of mouth. That's great. That's Thank great. you. Awesome. Ryan, thanks for making Thank the time. So Thanks, Scott.